So what, the topic I want to preach on tonight is the topic of suffering. The topic of suffering. And suffering is something that, uh, you know, that, that isn't a pleasant thing to talk about, but the fact is it's something that's a very, it's very real. You know, it says there in uh, Revelation 21, uh, and I heard a, a, a voice, a verse, excuse me, in verse, uh, I don't know what verse is it, I don't have a verse right now. It says there, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God, and shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. Now the fact that we God has to do this in the future, that this is a futuristic event, something that God actually does in the new heaven and the new earth, tells us you know, that's a reality that we have to deal with in the meantime. That until then, there is going to be death. There is going to be sorrow. There is going to be crying and mourning. There is going to be suffering in this life. And that's really the first point of the sermon this, uh, this evening, is the fact that suffering is a reality. You know, uh, it's something that we're all going to have to deal with to some degree or another if we live long enough. You know, children maybe not as, or, you know, hopefully aren't as acquainted with this as we adults are. But anyone that's lived any length of time has probably to some degree already been acquainted with grief, already been acquainted with having to go through some suffering in their life, whether it's themselves or a loved one or somebody that they know. They've seen them go through some kind of suffering. So the first point I want to make and just drive home is that suffering is reality. That is something that we have to face up to in this life. You know, we don't want to get this idea that just because we're Christians that somehow God is just going to, you know, pave the way with a bed of roses all the way to heaven, that life's never going to have any toil, life's never going to have any struggle, that it's going to be our best life now for the rest of our life, and that there will never be any suffering. You know, we're going to look at a lot of Scripture tonight and see that it's actually quite the contrary, that God allows His people to suffer very often, and that it's something that we have to go through, and it's that something that even God Himself went through, that God was one who He Himself suffered. So we see, first of all, that suffering is a reality, and it comes with the territory of serving God. You know, if we're going to serve God, we talked a little about this morning when, when you know, about how if we stand with Jesus, if we're going to take that stand, that we're going to endure some persecutions, we're going to endure some afflictions. You know, suffering is something that comes with the territory of serving God. If you're going to serve God and live for Him, you might as well just mark it down that you are going to suffer to some degree. Now, if you would, go ahead and first, turn over to first, uh, first Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. Suffering is something that we can expect if we're going to live for God. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. He says there that we labor and suffer reproach. We labor, we work for God, we do God's will, we serve Him, and we also suffer reproach. And why is it that we suffer reproach? Because we trust in the living God. You know, trusting the living God and, and being a Christian and being an independent fundamental Baptist, being somebody who believes every word and, and line in this book, is something that often will bring reproach upon you from the world. And reproach is often a source of suffering in our lives. It can be something that we have to suffer under. <clears throat> Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For here, even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. I mean, Jesus Christ suffered for himself. God himself suffered for us. And why did he do that? To leave us an example that we should follow in his steps. You know, we should never shy away from suffering. We should never, you know, skirt that or try to get around it. It was the example that was set by Jesus Christ. Why? So that we would know and expect that suffering is a part of the Christian life. And Jesus is one example. We could consider several other examples throughout Scripture of, of those that suffered. I mean, we can go all the way back to the Old Testament. We can think about Joseph, right? The, the child of, 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 uh, of Jacob, of Israel. And think about the son. We, often when we tell children about Joseph, about you know how he was made the second greatest in command of all Egypt, how he saved the nation, how he saved his brothers and the 70 souls which were in Canaan, and his father, we can tell about the coat of many colors and how his father loved him. But there was also a lot of suffering that Joseph went through. Before he ever got to that exalted place in Egypt, before he was ever brought up, where was he brought up out of? Out of a prison. You know, his brothers sold him into slavery. 
You know, his brothers despised him and hated him. He lived, you know, he was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. He was cast into a prison. He had no idea if he was ever going to get out. But he continued to be faithful and trust in the living God. But in the meantime, he had to suffer, didn't he? So that's one example. We can think about Moses. Moses is another great example of somebody who endured some suffering. If you go turn over to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. I mean, Moses was nearly killed as a, as a young child. I mean, from, from birth. I mean, Pharaoh wanted him cast in the, in the river. He wanted him to, his life snuffed out. I mean, that's some suffering. That would have been some suffering for his parents. And he grew up in, in Egypt. And it says here in, in Hebrews 11, chapter 24, By faith, when he was come to years, refused to be called the sons of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. He would rather be identified with the people of God and suffer along with them than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So if you're going to identify with the people of God, if you're going to be a part of the number that claims the name of Christ, you have to expect and mark it down that one you to some degree or another, you are going to suffer. But you think about Daniel and the three Hebrew children. I mean, they were taken captive out of their homeland. You know, they were they, they were brought to a strange land. You know, they were the prince of the eunuchs. You know, I, I believe that the Bible is teaching us there very delicately that Daniel himself was a eunuch. You know, that's not anything we would want to suffer. That's something that he went through. It's something that his, you know, he, he never had a family or anything like that. That's something that he suffered. And, uh, you know, of course, he, he was tried to, they even tried to feed him to the, the den of lions. You know, I mean, he went through some real suffering in his life. I mean, the three Hebrew children were cast into a fiery furnace. Now, of course, we know the story that God miraculously de delivered them, but they didn't know that going into it. They had to take some real strong stands in their Christian life, and as a result, they suffered for it. So we see, first of all, that suffering is, an, is a, a reality. We have the example of Jesus. We have the examples in the Old Testament. And you say, well, you know, those are, those are examples. Those are things we can expect. But, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be me. That doesn't necessarily that if I live for God, that I'm, I'm going to have to suffer. But let me tell you, there are no exceptions. If you're going to live for God, you are going to suffer uh, to some degree. Go ahead and turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, and bring many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. I mean, if our, the captain of our faith, if the bishop of our souls was the one who went and suffered for us, that he suffered even unto death, should we really think that we are the exception, that somehow we're going to live this Christian life, that somehow we're going to live for God? That, and, and that we're going to get get away scot-free without having to endure any kind of affliction, any kind of a suffering. <clears throat> we really shouldn't. There are no exceptions. We will suffer. Look here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. It says here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, patience. That's good right there, Paul. You can stop right there. Don't go any further. Paul, we don't want you to say anything else, right? Because it's that next verse where things get a little heavy. We don't mind Paul's doctrine. We don't mind Paul's manner of life. We're all for Paul's purpose. We're all for Paul's faith. We know this long-suffering. We love his charity and his patience. It's when it goes on there in that next verse there. Persecutions, afflictions. That's when it starts to get real. That's when we start to say, eh, I don't know about this. This might be a little too much. Which came to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured. But out of them all the Lord delivered me. And then he says this, yea, and all, not some, not a few, not maybe not the majority, not a minority, he says all, everybody, is going, uh, all that will live God in Christ Jesus shall, so, shall suffer persecution. You say, well, I have never suffered persecution. I'm not going through anything like that. Well, are you living godly? And you might want to check that out. You might want to see if you really are living a godly life then, because this Bible says right here that if you do live a godly life, you will suffer persecution. Now, I'm not saying you have to be persecuted every single day of your life, but I'm saying there should probably be, you know, you can mark it down that if you're going to take certain stands in the Word of God, if you're going to have certain standards in your life, that there are going to be times that you're going to suffer, be it from 
family members, be it from friends, be it from the world, whoever it might be, that we are going to suffer to some degree. The Bible says in James 5, Take my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord, for an example. An example of what? Suffering, affliction, and of patience. We know we're supposed to look to the prophets who have spoken the word of God to us in the Old Testament. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, all these, these prophets, these mighty men of God. I mean, go read those books. Go, 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 go read Ezekiel. How uh, he had to lay on his side for hundreds of days and then flip over and lay his, on his other side the, and, and watch his people be destroyed and preach judgment and, and wrath from God and, then, and people being stiff-necked and hard-hearted. The suffering that he endured. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, he's called. These men were suffering and they are our example here, the Bible says. <clears throat> he goes on and says, Behold, we count them with happy which endure. You have heard the patience of Job. I mean, there's a whole book of a guy of him just suffering. He loses his wife. He loses his, well, he doesn't lose his wife. He loses his children. His wife tells him to curse God and die. He loses all of his possessions. And then and you say, well, that's bad. That's pretty bad. And then he gets covered from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet with boils. And he sits there and scrapes himself with a pot shirt. And he's, he's in such misery that he wishes to die. And then on top of all of that, his friends come along, so-called friends, and they just compound it by saying, hey, God's judging you. That's why you're like this. Because you're a wicked person, Job. They basically you know, condemned Job when he was completely innocent. So we have all these examples, and, and we should take from that the fact that there are no exceptions. That if we live godly in Christ Jesus, we are going to endure some suffering in this life. We say, oh, that's that sounds pretty ominous, and it is. You know, it's not exactly the most uplifting and cheerful sermon. You should have been here this morning if that's what you wanted. That was a little bit more of a positive sermon. But, you know, this is a reality that we have to face. And uh, suffering comes, and it comes in different forms. Now, it mentions there in Revelation 21, and again, I apologize, I should have had you keep something there, but in Revelation 21, it talks about the way that suffering comes. It comes in through pain, and it comes through death. I mean, those are two major sources of suffering for us as human beings. You know, pain. We, have, we suffer physical pain, we suffer emotional pain. Those are things that we have to go through in this life. You know, we, get, we, we ourselves get some kind of a disease or an ailment, you know, we have to suffer through that. And that can be a real, you know, difficulty to go through. We think about emotional pain, you know, maybe we have to watch somebody else that we know and love go through some difficult, you know, physical ailment, some trial in their life. That can cause suffering not only on their part, but we suffer along with them emotionally. We feel for them, we grieve for them, we mourn for them. It comes in the form of death. I mean, everyone's bound to face that at least some point in their life. Some kind of a death in the family, a friend. You know, I'm sure we could go around the room and all share experiences of people that we know and that, that are no longer with us, that have died, that have gone on. And that's a, that's a real suffering, isn't it? We don't want to make light of that. That's that's how the suffering comes often. You know, if it's not, if it's not going to be suffering for God, well, you can just mark it down that life itself is going to deal some suffering towards you. You know, in the form of, of pain and death. You think of loved ones. I mean, think of all the innocents who died. All the suffering that's going on out there due to wars of, of aggression and, and the abortion holocaust that's taking place and all the, the innocent blood that's being shed all across the world today. I mean, innocents are just constantly being slaughtered today. And it ought to cause, there's real suffering going on in the world. You know, we got it pretty good over here in America. We're pretty sheltered. We're in a bubble. You know, and, and we're, you know, we have all these first world problems. The biggest, toughest decision we usually have is deciding where to go to lunch. <laughs> but there's other parts in the world where people are really suffering. And they're going through it every single day. They endure such har hardships that we might never even know in this life. And that's just, that's just the way of life for them. They don't know anything else. And suffering always has the same effect. No matter how it comes to us, what form, what shape it takes, suffering always has the same effect on us. And what is the result of suffering? It's always sorrow. It's always sorrow. It's always mourning. It's always weeping. It's always tears. Sorrow has, is the effect that suffering brings. And that's, I think, why people go to such lengths today to avoid suffering. Because nobody likes sorrow. At least you shouldn't. You know, unless you're some kind of goth or emo or something. Kind of you got other issues we can talk about, right? But no one, no one goes out of their way and says, "Man, I want to be sorrowful today. I wanna, I wanna be down in the dumps. I wanna feel bad." 
But that's what comes into our life. That is the effect that suffering brings into our lives. You know, we should not seek to avoid a life of pain. We should never seek that. We should never try to skirt pain. We should always take it head on, allow sorrow to have its, its run its course in our lives. You know, and when people go to such lengths today to avoid any kind of discomfort, be it physical, be it emotional, you know, mental, they, they, they want to not have any kind of discomfort. They don't want to have any kind of sorrow in their life. And what ends up happening is they end up going down some very dangerous paths. <clears throat> and the Bible is very clear here that we should not we should not try to avoid sorrow. We should not try to avoid suffering. The Bible says there is a time to weep. There's a time to laugh. And it says there is a time to mourn and a time to dance. You know, to everything there is a season. Sorrow is a natural part of life. Feeling bad, mourning, weeping. These are things, these are normal human emotions that we should not, we, we should not uh, make a point of trying to avoid. We should allow those things to happen. And it's when people try to avoid that, when they try to get away from any kind of suffering, when they try to get away from any type of sorrow in their life, that they end up going down very dangerous paths. I mean, think about all the drunks and drug addicts that are hooked on some kind of a drug, some kind of a hardcore drug like heroin, or they're just, they drink themselves to death because they're trying to escape. Whether it's some kind of physical ailment, but a lot of times it's some kind of a mental or emotional problem that they have. You know, they're just trying to drown their sorrows. They're just trying to forget about some painful memory. So they just get hooked on drugs and alcohol, and they just try to get away from it that way. What about psychoactive drug use? I mean, the approved drugs today, right? The antidepressants. And that's going through the roof, by the way. I mean, just in the last decade or two, that has, in America especially, it has gone through the roof. Those rates are astounding. And what's crazy about it is that I looked into some statistics very briefly, and female or women use double that of men. Now, now why is that? Is that be, you know it's a psychoactive thing? It's probably because you know women tend to be a little bit more emotional. They, their their hormones are all over the place from time to time, and they go through these bouts of depression and things like that. So they are the ones that are more likely to, if they're trying to be the ones to not go through that, they're trying not to have this suffering, have this sorrow in their life, that they're the ones that are gravitating to this, this type of a thing, to taking some kind of a drug that's going to mellow them out so that they don't have to go through that range of emotions that they're prone to. Mm -hmm. It's double the use of that of men. I mean, how else do you explain it? <laughs> now, I don't know what this means, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway because I thought it was at least interesting. Is that white people use three to four times more than any other race? <laughs> now you take that for whatever. I don't. I can't explain that. That's crazy to me. I don't. I don't know what's going on there. With that. Why is it that Caucasians are, are are taking so many more antidepressants than than all the other races? But that's that's that. Let's clean it up, white people. You know. Hey, let's <laughs> let's work on that a little bit, right? But this is the path that people go down. They go down taking antidepressants, getting hooked on drugs, be they legal or illegal, they start drinking. Why? Because they don't want to feel any sorrow. They don't ever want to be depressed. They don't want to mourn. They don't ever want to go through any kind of suffering. And you know, I'm not saying that there, there isn't a time to say there's an unnatural amount of sorrow that's going on. Like maybe someone's going a little too far with it. Like maybe they're just chronically in a, in, a, in a rut. And you know, a lot of times that's why people feel like they have to go to these ends because they just can't figure out what's wrong and they have to they go to a doctor and he just says take this pill and uh, that's what they do <coughs> you know I'm not saying there aren't maybe times where we have to sit back and say what what's going on here why is this always the case with me and but I think there's some other things that we should try to do before we go and take some kind of a drug and I really just want to give, just here at this, make a practical application at this point in the sermon, and just give some tips for depression. Just give some just common sense, you know, just home remedy type of things of how to deal with depression a little bit. Now, if you would, uh, turn over to Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. One of the first things a person can do, you know, if you find yourself just constantly, because again, the Bible says there's a season to everything. There's a time to mourn, yes, but there's also a time to laugh. So if you find yourself never laughing, you know, you're always mourning, that's not good either. I'm not saying you should, I'm saying you should never avoid, uh, you know, you shouldn't try to avoid suffering, but also you shouldn't make it a, a permanent way of life either. 
You know, there's a balance here that we need to strike. And I think there's some things that we could do to kind of help us balance things out in our life to where we're not always down in the dumps. We're not always depressed. One of the first things we could do is, you know, take a time out. You know, life gets crazy and hectic. You know, I'm not, I know not everybody can do this. But find some kind of a place or something where you can just chill out for a minute and just kind of relax. You know, <laughs> go watch a sunset. Go for a walk. Get outside. I think that's one of the biggest things that people miss out on. Yeah. It's just a simple act of just going outside and listening to a bird chirp. You know, they forget all the little things in the world that can bring joy to us. Watch a sunset. I'd say go sit by a lake, but we're in Arizona, right? You know, so here's here's my tip. You know, if you if you gotta have the the, the waters, something I like to do at home when things are getting crazy around the house, because you know I live in a house, an apartment actually with four kids, young children, and, and kids will be kids, and they gotta run around and play and make noise. And if I just yelled at them every time they made a peep, you know, I'd probably go, I'd lose my voice, right? So I have to find my little sanctuary. I gotta find out my little, my little, uh, I don't wanna say safe place, but I'll, my little time out, right? My little, my little place where I can kind of get away. And what I do is I'll go on YouTube and I'll actually listen to like ambient lake sounds, like ambient swamp night with crickets and frogs, and rain and thunderstorms, and that's very relaxing. I mean, I wrote a lot of these sermons doing that, you know, in my home. I could sit down at my kitchen table and just go, and the kids can run around me, and I'm just not distracted. I don't know if that'd be a health to you or not. I don't know. Place, put on some good, godly Christian music, something to remind you of the goodness of God. Go outside and behold His creation. Go out at night and look at the stars and remember there's something bigger than you and that life you know is worth living Amen. Yeah. eat well balanced meals i mean that's a big one if our guard you know our diet you know affects our mood that's a big part of it if we're constantly eating junk and bad food that's going to affect your mood you know i don't have a lot of time or really knowledge to break it down for you to explain all the you know the nuances of you know your, your biochemistry and everything like that and the way you're you know, your nutrition affects your mind and your well-being, but that is a fact. I mean, you can't really deny that. I mean, I know it in my own personal life that when I'm eating better foods and balanced meals and, and watching what I eat, I'm typically in a better mood. I'm typically a nicer person to be around, even nicer than I already am. <laughs> right? And let me just say, on this point, I want to throw this out there. Low-fat diets are not good for your mood, okay? This is the truth. Because that's the big craze that was that we were raised, my generation was raised under. I remember my parents, you know, low fat, everything was, you know, margarine and, and all these fake fats and things like that. It turns out they're wrong. That fats, you know, is what saturated fats, I and mean, that makes up the majority of what your brain is made out of. I mean, these types of things, these are things that you need. That's why vegans, the people who go on these low fat diets, are crazy. <laughs> you know, not, the person on the low fat diet is not fun to be around. Are they? You ever notice that when you go to a barbecue place, they're the nicest people? When we go over to Smokey Bows, I mean, I'm getting high fives. The guy knows my name. He's always grinning, you know, because he works around all that saturated fat. He's working around all those delicious meats that have that fat hanging out the pork and the Amen. steak, you know? So, you know, they just, I mean, there's some anecdotal evidence for you that low fat diets are not good for your mood. And we see that here in Nehemiah chapter 8. Look at uh, Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8. So they read the book uh, in the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, which is the Tershatha, and Ezra, the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. And he says this, More not nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the Lord. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, neither be ye sorry, for the Lord is your strength. So we see that when people are eating fat, you know, they're not sorry. That they're going to have a, that's rejoicing. You know, a good, healthy fat will bring some joy in your life. So the point I'm trying to make here is that if you're suffering with depression all the time, if sorrow is just a way of life, rather than just going for the Zoloft or the Prozac or whatever drug you're prescribing, it, maybe you just need to, you know, reach over and get some carrot gold. Irish butter, you know, and get some whole milk and get some fat in your diet or check out what it is that you're eating. Another basic tip would be like this. It would be to get enough sleep. Now, I know all the mothers in the room are probably staring daggers at me right now, like how dare you even suggest that I try to get any kind of sleep when I'm raising all these kids. And I know that can be difficult, but you know, men suffer with depression too. And I think a lot of times it's because we don't get enough sleep. 
I know when I when I don't get enough sleep, I am I am not. I don't care how much fat. Right? I'm, I'm like a bear coming out of the bedroom, just like Arr! you know, like angry. <laughs> I have to usually if I get a nap, my my mood improves as well. But we should try and get enough sleep. And here's a tip for for the for the busy mother, you know, the mother who has a lot of kids. You know, you need to sleep when babies sleep. That's like that's the, my wife when she heard that and figured that out. It was like. Oh. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's how they do it. That's how these mothers do it. When the baby sleeps, you sleep. So that's kind of a tip there. Maybe that'll help. But really, to get enough sleep, the really the best way to do it is to is to make sure that you're going to bed early enough and and that it's it's working in your schedule. <laughs> I mean, you think about it. The best way to end a bad day is just to go to bed early. Just hit the reset button. Just say enough of this. You know, I'm going to bed. And, Wake up and just count that day as a dream. You know, that just get that get this over this thing over with. <clears throat> you know, uh, the Bible talks about the fact that um, the Lord's mercies are new every morning, right? They're, they're new every morning. If you have a bad day, let's just go to bed. You know, let's let's have a glass of warm whole milk, get the sack, and wake up and have a better day. Another tip would be to exercise. Get some daily exercise of some sort. Even if it's just going for a walk. Just going out and walking 20 minutes. Going out walking 30 minutes. Or getting some kind of regular uh, physical regimen, you know, where you're actually exercising, working out. I mean, it's a, it's a fact that if you work out, if you actually exercise, you release endorphins in your brain that make you, put you in a better mood. They make you feel better. But, you know... It requires exercising, right? And that's 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 the that's the price you gotta pay, right? You gotta load up the bar, you gotta get on the treadmill, you gotta do whatever it is you gotta do. But you know that improves people's mood when they exercise. You know, we're just sitting around lethargic, we're not doing anything, we're just dwelling on our problems, dwelling on our shortcomings or whatever it might be, you know, and, and, and not happy with this about ourselves, not happy about that with our situation, whatever it might be. You know, how can you not be depressed? How is that not going to lead to being a, a kind of down in the mouth type of person? But if we're, you know, taking care of ourselves and, and getting the exercise that we need, you know, we're going to be happier people. Here's another big one, you know, especially if we suffer from anxiety. You know, that's another big part, you know, it's not just depression, it's like people worry a lot today. It is accept that you cannot control everything. I mean, this was, this, this was, you know, revolutionary. This was something, and it sounds so simple, but, you know, it's a philosophy that we really need to put in place in our lives, that we shouldn't worry about things that are beyond our control. You know, uh, how's, that, how's the AA, what's the air prayer? Uh, Lord, help me to accept the things that I can't, grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, to change the things I can't, I don't know, I've never been to AA. But it's up along that, those lines, you know, help us to accept the things that we cannot change. If we sit there and worry about things that we have no power to control, what's the point? Well, I mean, you're not, you're not going to change anything by worrying. So we need to learn to kind of let go of things, too. We accept the fact that you cannot control everything. How about this? Welcome humor. You know, welcome humor. The best therapy in life is learning to laugh a little bit. You may be able to learn, learn how to laugh at yourselves, even. And, and you know, I would... I think of this morning as a perfect example. I was trying to, to, to see the humor of what had happened about how I was coming out of Phoenix and ran right into a roadblock that somebody had already told me about. Somebody had said, hey, tomorrow you're going down to Tucson. There's a roadblock in the 10. And I got to the roadblock and I said, oh, yeah, somebody told me about it. <laughs> now, you guys are laughing, right? You think it's funny. I wish I could have done that this morning because it would have been a big stress relief. Uh -huh. You know, I wouldn't have to call Fabian and, and tell him to be all nervous about having to get up and lead off the hello. I wouldn't have to have gone faster than normal down the freeway, weave through track to try to get here on time. You know, but and I wish I could have seen some humor in that. But you know, we should try to welcome humor. We should learn to laugh at ourselves a little bit. Learn to see uh, the, the, the silver lining. You know, a good laugh goes a long way, doesn't it? You ever you ever been around somebody who can make you laugh and get you going? I mean, it puts you in a better mood. You walk away kind of permagrinning. You know, your cheeks hurt, your stomach hurts, but you're in a good mood. You feel better. You wanna you wanna do the same for other people, and that's a biblical concept. You think, oh, that's that's just your opinion, man. But it's it says in Proverbs 17, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. A merry heart, you know, one that's lighthearted, one that can laugh a little, one that can be merry and joyful and and and, and bring cheer into people's other people's lives. 
but it says a broken spirit drieth the bones. I mean, that's what's going to make you weak and brittle. You can't I mean, think about a broken spirit drying bones. I mean, bones are what's going to support you and hold you up. It's what helps you bear weight. And life's going to bring some weight into your life. There are going to be things that we have to bear, responsibilities you know, that we have to take, uh, take hold of. And there's going to be suffering that comes. There's going to be heavy burdens that come into our lives. And if we have these dry bones, you know, we're going to be brittle. We're going to be frail. We're going to be weak. And we're just going to crumble. But if we have that merry heart, it's like a medicine, the Bible says. It's like a medicine. It'll help cure us. It'll help make us feel better. <clears throat> What's another tip to help deal with the suffering that's inevitably going to come into our lives? The sorrow that is guaranteed to come into our lives in some shape or form. What's another tip? Get involved in, in other people. Get involved in other people. I mean, one of the best things we can do is, you know, they, a lot of like... Uh, Social scientists or psychologists will tell depressed people, you need to go volunteer somewhere. You need to go get in a soup kitchen. You need to go give haircuts to the homeless. I don't know. You know, go do something for somebody else and get your mind off of yourself. I mean, so often that's where depression comes from is we just sit there and dwell on our own problems. And I think we have it worse than everybody else. I guarantee you, no matter how bad you think you have it, somebody's always got it worse. There's always somebody that has it worse. And I tell you what, if you would go out and get involved in other people, you probably find out pretty quick that there's people that have it a lot worse than you that are probably a lot in a lot closer proximity. I mean, why don't you come along on one of these Indian soul winning trips? We're getting ready to fire that thing back up here at the end of this month and plan some serious trips out to the Indian uh, reservations. You should come out to one of those and, and see how, how rough those people have it and, and, and the, the history and the suffering that those people have gone through. And see what kind of conditions they're living in. And you'll go home and you'll appreciate your 900 square foot, you know, apartment. You'll appreciate the fact that you live in South Phoenix a little bit more. You'll appreciate that wherever it is, that whatever you think you have it so bad in your life, go see, go visit some African country. Go visit some third world country and come home. And you'll say, wow, I'm, I'm so glad that we have access to all these great things. I mean, we've got it pretty good. I mean, for the, for the, for the peasant class that we are here in this country, I mean, we have it phenomenal. We've got it really good. But we lose sight of that. People lose sight of that. Why? Because they, they're too focused on themselves. You know, I think a big part of it is soul winning. I mean, just going out and going soul winning. I know there's been times in my life I've been upset about something, I've been depressed about something, I've been worried about something. You know, I say, well, I guess, you know, I go soul winning. It's like, I, for at least those few hours I'm not soul winning, I forget about all of it. Amen. I'm only focused about one thing, is trying to give that gospel to that lost soul. And it's like everything else in my life, it just goes up on the back burner. You know, and I, and I get lost in that, <laughs> in winning others. The Bible says, as the cold of snow in the time of harvest, so is a faithful messenger to them that send him, for he refresheth the soul of his masters. And why don't you go be that cold of snow in a time of harvest? Why don't you go be refreshing to somebody else? Instead of always being the person, being the person that always has to be refreshed, be the person that always has to be cheered up, or somebody always has to come to you and lift you up out of the doldrums. If we would go do that for somebody else, we would probably help ourselves in the process. You know, and that kind of leads me to the next point: is just talk to somebody. You know, if you're really down about something, the best thing you can do is to go talk to somebody about it. Have a confident, confident, have a friend, have somebody that you can confide in, and maybe not necessarily just a spouse. I mean, I know. You know, our, as wives and husbands, we should be very close and be willing to talk about these things. And but sometimes the spouse is the source of that, of that problem. I mean, you know, and I'm not saying we should go badmouth our spouses to anybody ever. You know, if you do that, that's a wicked thing. You know, and you should shut that down. If someone comes to you and starts badmouthing their spouse to you, shut them down. Say so that's wicked. You shouldn't talk about your spouse like that. But maybe you could go and talk to them about a problem that you're having personally in some area and you know have somebody that you can fight and just say, hey you know I'm, I'm feeling this way and just kind of I mean I think it's a big one for ladies guys we, we really don't do this you know <laughs> maybe we should I don't know probably not gonna happen I'll be honest but I mean I think this is a big one for ladies and that's why church is so important especially ladies that are trying to live a biblical godly Christian life let's face it the world does not does not support that lifestyle they mock it they ridicule it they put it down, you know, you're, you, the ladies, you know, they would have you to believe that you're living in this patriarchal, misogynistic, 
you know, cult that's just there to oppress you, and you know, they they're they're stealing your chance to go out and and fulfill, you know, the the world's goals of, you know, earning an income, acting like a man. I guess I guess that's what it means to be a woman today out in the world is to go be a man. You know, I I don't get it. It's completely backwards. At least here. You know, you're given a biblical role of what a woman is supposed to be, and that's what a, you know. That's there's nothing more feminine than doing what the Bible says, Amen. being a mother, you know, being a a wife. Those are feminine roles. I mean, that's that's what womanhood is all about in a lot of ways. That's that's a big part of it. But let's face it, that's not easy to do if you don't have that support, if you don't have the friends within a local body, a church that are, that are going through the same struggles, that are going through the same difficulties and trials and troubles that you face as a wife, as a mother, then, uh, you know, it's going to be difficult. And you need that friend. You need someone to talk to. The Bible says in Proverbs 27, Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart. So doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. You know, the hearty counsel from another friend, the Bible says it's like a perfume that rejoices your heart. You know, talking to somebody, sharing with them what you're going through, then being able to counsel you, you know, understand. I guess the thing with women is they just... They don't want us to fix everything, right? They just want us to listen. Is that right? I'm finally starting to figure this out. You know, you tell a man that, he's just like, well, what can I do to fix it? You know, he just, he just wants to fix everything, make it stop. They just want you to listen. They just want you to understand, right? Well, guys are kind of, aren't that way. So maybe ladies in the church, they can they can kind of give that to one another. They can, you know, and men, we can work on that as husbands. We could, we could try to do that. <laughs> you know, go against our own nature, but anyway. Um, but it says when you have that, it's like a perfume. It's like an ointment that rejoices the heart. You know, it brings joy into your heart. It brings peace and comfort into a person's heart. <clears throat> you know, so we should never try. And these are just some basic tips about how to avoid, you know, uh, other avenues of dealing with sorrow. Because here's the thing: as I started out the service, sorrow is bound to come. It's going to happen. You know, there is going to be suffering that comes in your life, and the result of suffering is sorrow. It comes into our lives, and if we're not careful, if we don't learn how to deal with that, and accept it, and embrace it, and learn how that we can cope with it in, in, in a godly manner, we're going to find ourselves going down the wrong path. And it will probably make things worse, not better. <clears throat> you know, but here, here's the thing. We should beware of the person who cannot mourn. You know, the person who just is, refuses to mourn, refuses to have sorrow in life, they just will not accept this, they, they will go to great lengths to avoid it, you need to look out for that person. You need to watch out. You know, mourning is something that we should allow to happen. There are times that we should do it. I'm not saying it's something that we should avoid altogether, but I mean, it is something, you know, obviously it should not become a permanent way of life, but... You know, we also have to be aware of the person who refuses to ever mourn or ever go through sorrow. The Bible says in James 4, Draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted. He's saying be afflicted. And mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to have heaviness. You know, if, if we've been a source of grief, if we've been a, a you know living a life of sin, if we've been vaccinated, if we're not right with God, there is a time when we should be afflicted. We should afflict ourselves. We should, we should be sorry about something that happened. We should weep over something that's taken place. We should allow our laughter be, to be turned to mourning and our joy to heaviness. There's a time for that. There's a place for that. And we should be aware of the, of the person who refuses to allow that to happen. And Because the danger is of people becoming desensitized to the suffering of others. I mean, that's a real possibility in our culture today. I mean, our culture is full of violence, you know, you know, in the movies, in the video games, in the music. It's just a culture of death and violence, people being violated. It's all over. And uh, we should just really beware of that, lest we become desensitized to the suffering of others. I mean, we go on the news and we just hear about story after story of these, you know, like Palestinians that are just these children, innocents, that are just being massacred. The school shootings that are just taking place over and over and over again. All the horrible things that are going on, the innocence. And if we're not careful, we can just let that become part of life. Well, that's just, you know, that's as plain as the light 
at the at the at the corner turning from red to green, and that we become desensitized to it. And we should we should be careful of that that we become desensitized to the suffering of others. And let me go off on a tangent. Let me get it off my chest again. I know I go off on this, but I'm going to keep going off on this because it, it's I see it all the time. I saw it again yesterday. People are so desensitized to the suffering of others that they care more about the life of some dumb animal than they do a human being. Amen. And I saw it again yesterday. Someone posts a six-minute video of a mailman getting mauled by a pit bull. I mean mauled. He's on the ground. Pit bull's just thrashing him, tearing up his leg. And this person goes on there and just says, you know, and so here, here's the thing. You have a pit bull mauling you. I mean, what's your instinct? To try and talk the dog off? <laughs> Offer to treat? Here, here, calm down. No, that's never going to happen. And get real. Yep. You know, this person <laughs> saying, oh, there's a more humane way to deal with that animal. Because the people in the video, they're, you know, they must have been, I'm guessing they live somewhere in southeast Michigan. It just looked like it. And the fact that nobody had a gun on them. Mm -hmm. They didn't even have a, so much as a pocket knife. I'm like, why isn't anybody stabbing this thing? You know, eventually you see somebody come out with a broomstick and like doing this. <laughs> this lady, you know. I mean, she was probably all, you know, 100 pounds maybe just trying to smack this vicious mutt with a broomstick. I mean, A for effort, I guess, you know. And then we snapped that thing, made a point, and thrust it through his abdomen. <laughs> and then you see this guy come out of nowhere with a, tra a plastic trash can. You know, thanks for the plastic trash cans. We're, bring back the tin. Bring back the metal trash can so we can deal with these animals, right? And he throws it at the thing. So this dog's being beaten with a stick, having a trash can thrown at it repeatedly. People are slapping at it, and it just keeps mauling. And I'm telling you, it goes on for six minutes. The guy even gets out mace, I believe, at one point. He tries to spray the dog. And then in the comments, there's a guy who says, I'm a mailman. Mace works on every dog but pit bulls. He like knows from experience. Mace won't. Wow. So I'm going to get some mace. It ain't going to work for a pit bull. No. It's going to make him more aggressive. <laughs> and this person gets on there and says, you know, you know, I feel it's, it's terrible what the dog's doing, but it's terrible what they're doing to the dog, too. <laughs> and I'm just, you know, I didn't realize I was so easily triggered. But it turns out I am. There's a way to trigger Brother Corbin, and it's to stand up for a pit bull. If you want to apologize to pit bulls to me, and, and if that's you in the room tonight, please do not come to me after the service and apologize for pit bulls. Don't do it. I don't want to get triggered. I was triggered yesterday. I'm finally getting over it a little bit. This is very therapeutic to me right now. I'm kind of get this off my chest. But this is the danger of becoming desensitized to the suffering of others. So where do you go? You can see a human being being mauled and think, oh, that poor dog. Oh, look how they're treating that poor animal. Yeah. Here's the, and they finally they get they finally somebody comes out with one of those uh, anti theft bars that used to put in your the club. The club mm -hmm. Remember that you put in your steering wheel. The guy comes out with that and beats the dog. And I think the dog finally lets go. The dog staggers and falls over in the street. And the guy's recording it from his car. And I'm like, perfect, run him over. <laughs> right? And you think, oh, that's that that's going too far, brother Corbin. The dog gets up and chases another person into their house. After having been beaten, after falling over, you know, you know, in the street, staggering and collapsing, it, it gathers the will and the strength and, to rise again and pursue another human being to try and maul it and rip it to shreds. I mean, <laughs> these animals, I've gone off on pimples before, I'm not going to do it again. But I'm just trying, it was just a perfect example, it fit in with the sermon today. That's the danger of becoming desensitized to the suffering of people. Is that you'll sit there and you will value a dog over a human being. And I told that person that. I said, you value a dog over a human. I do not. I said, your words were, it's terrible what they're doing. To the, that, that, it's terrible what the dog's doing, but it's terrible the way they're handling that dog. Look, someone should have pulled out a Glock or a, you know, any kind of a SIG <laughs> or even a 1911. I wouldn't even allow that. <laughs> so pulled out some kind of a weapon and put a bullet in that dog's head. Carefully, man. accurately, you know, with great care is not to injure the human. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, last night, I'm laying there in bed thinking about the sermon, and I started going off. I'm like preaching in my head, trying to fall asleep about this point, and I'm imagining all the ways that I would have destroyed this animal. <laughs> I mean, I start to envision myself, you know, full samurai garb, you know, with, the, with the katana blade, the Japanese samurai sword, just like, just like chopping the dog's head off. You know, I would have taken the broomstick, snapped it in half, thrust it to the abdomen. You know, I would have gone for the eyes. Would have taken my belt off, wrapped it around its neck, and choked it out. You know, something. 
and, or I would have loved to have been there. I know, I'm, it's in the car, but I'm not, I've got issues, so I'm working through them. But, you know, that's, that's where my mind went. Something, get, why? Because the guy who's being mauled. Yeah. Well, that's too extreme, Brother Corbin. That guy is going to live with those injuries for the rest of his life. Yeah. Have a pit bull go sink its teeth into your ankle and tell me that that's not, as a mailman, as a carrier who does nothing but walking every day, yeah. that's going to affect your livelihood, that's going to affect your family, it's going to affect your future for the rest of your life. And yet people will get on there, more than one person, and say, oh, that poor dog. You're desensitized to the suffering of others. Mm -hmm. You've become desensitized, and that's what our culture does. <clears throat> you know, it's okay for us to mourn. It's okay to be sorry. It's okay to, be, to feel bad. It's okay to show a range of emotions, believe it or not. It makes you relatable. You know, we don't all have to be just these constantly happy, you know, always in a great mood, always just super friendly. I mean, sometimes people have a bad day. You know, and we have to allow for that because sometimes we have a bad day. And it makes us more human. It makes us more down to earth and relatable. Amen. <clears throat> you know, quite frankly, you know, we should accept suffering because Suffering is not a bad thing. We have this connotation that, I mean, I'm not saying it's pleasant. I'm not saying it's something we want to go through, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, the Bible says it makes us better people. Go ahead and turn over to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. You know, people who haven't endured a lot of affliction in their life out of necessity, people who haven't had to go through bad things, who haven't had to go through typical times in their life, they're, they typically will not endure little people, a little uh, inconvenience out of desire. You know, people who, who haven't gone through some hardships in their life, you know, they're, they're, they're less likely to go through some hardship, even if it meant getting something they wanted. Because they don't, they're not you know, accustomed to it. They're not accustomed to hardships. They're not accustomed to afflictions. You know, someone grows up and they go through a hard time, you know, in their childhood maybe. You know, they learn what it is to suffer. They learn how to how to overcome obstacles in their life, you know, that actually could provide them some kind of ambition. That could actually give them drive and motivation. Say, hey, I've already come overcome this in my past, and they want to attain into some kind of a goal. But whatever those diff whatever difficulties get in the way between them and that goal, they're going to have an easier time getting and getting through those goals. Why? Because they are already accustomed to affliction. They're already accustomed to having to overcome difficulties and trials and tribulations in their life. But people who have everything handed to them, where everything just comes to them, life just dealt them a good hand, the parents just gave them everything they wanted, they never had to suffer, they never had to go anything. And people today, they go out of their way to raise children like this. Yeah. You know, they just want to give their kids everything that they never had. Yeah. And they limit the number of children that they're going to have. You know, I'd rather just have one or two kids and just to treat them incredibly well and make sure they never have any suffering, never, they never have want of anything. You know, it's good for kids to want. It's good for people to learn to suffer a little bit. I'm not saying kids should have to, you know, endure these atrocities that a lot of them do, but, I mean, there's nothing wrong with a kid having to earn their keep a little bit or having to go without some, some things that maybe other people get. It teaches them character. As cliche as that is, that's the truth. Suffering makes us better people. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 1. It is better to go to the house of mourning. It is better to go to the house of mourning than the house of feasting. Now, in our human condition, we'd say, you know, the house of the house of feasting, like we would go, okay, Golden Corral, no, I don't know, I don't know, maybe, right? It's a buffet. I hear these Mexican buffets you have down here in Tucson. We gotta try one of those. Okay, the house of feasting, right? Chipotle or In and Out, you pick it out, right? It's much more desirable to go there, right, than to like to the dentist. I mean, if I were to say, hey, you can either go get a root canal or a double double, what, what are you going to do? <laughs> right? You're going to go with the double double. I mean, that's just, what the Bible says here it's, the, it's going into the house of mourning that's better. You know, it's going, I mean, you might not like going to the dentist, but the teeth will be cleaner. Right? You, know, you probably won't have cavities. You know, he can help you out when you're really in suffering. <clears throat> so the Bible says it's better to go house, house of mourning than the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men. And a living will lay it to his heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, the Bible says. For by the sadness of countenance, the heart is made better. People who have suffered, people who have gone through some things, they are better people for it. You know, they at least have something, they have some, you know, a lot of times they can, they can comfort other people that go through those same things. 
When somebody else goes through that, they're, they're like, hey, I can relate to you. I can sympathize with you. I, here's what it was like for me. They're made better for it. Their hearts are made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. <clears throat> you know, I, hope, I don't want this to come across as an arrogant statement, but it's hard to say it without it at least sounding like that. Myself is an example, right? Speaking of being a better person, let me tell you about me. <laughs> That's not how I mean it. But I mean, I, I'm really, I'm, I'm a, I know me better than anybody else, so really often in sermons, that's the best example I can think of. You know, I came from a broken home. I came from a home where there was drunkenness and drug use and divorce and so on and so forth. And we don't need to get into all the nitty gritty. It doesn't really matter. But I came from a broken home. You know, there was some suffering in my childhood that, quite frankly, was not good. It's not something that I would ever want for my kids. And it's made me a better person for it. Well, how has it made me better? It hasn't made me perfect. I'm just saying it's made me better. Why? Because, you know, I might, I might not be perfect, but I'm a better father than mine. Amen. I've made a point in my life to be a better father than my, my father was. Yeah. You know, it makes us better parents. when we If we had poor parents growing up that treated us poorly that, you know, did the wrong things, you know, and I'm not trying to lay fault on my parents. They were lost sinners. They were walking according to the course of this world after the, the God of this present. They were children of disobedience. They were unsaved. I get it. You know, I'm not trying to, you know, get a pity party up here, but I'm just saying that, you know, it's a fact. It's an example that I can, that I can give you. And you can have your own. You can say, you know, I went through this in my life, and therefore I'm a better person for it because now I can whatever it might be. And I know for me, having gone through the childhood that I have, you know, it makes me want to provide a better childhood for my children. And the fact that, you know, we're not going to be drunks. We're not going to be all of these things. And we're going to, you know, be a better husband and father for it. You know, going through suffering makes us better people and make us better Christians. If you would, turn over to, uh, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. I told my wife this was going to be the short sermon tonight, but I, I might have been lying. <clears throat> we'll see if we can wrap it up here. You know, suffering is going to make us better. It says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, I'll be reading in verse 8, it says, For though I made you sorry with the letter, I do not repent. So Paul writes 1 Corinthians, and he basically just tears into the Corinthian people, tells them everything they're doing wrong, tears them down. And it made him sorry. And he says, you know what, I know I made you sorry. I know I made you mourn. I know I brought some affliction in your life. And he says, but I do not repent. Though I did repent. You know, he second-guessed himself is what he's saying. But at the end, he was glad that he did it. For I perceive that the same epistle that hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season, right? And that's a key point that we talked about early, earlier, that sorrow and mourning should be for a season. It should be a way of life. Now rejoice not that you were made sorry. He wasn't glad about that. I mean, no one is rejoicing. Oh, I get to go to the house of mourning. Oh, oh, I get affliction to come in my life. Yay! That's not why it makes you, that's not why we should embrace it or be happy about it. He says, not that, I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. It made them better people. Them having to be sorry about what they had done, having to have somebody come down on them and chew them out and tell them where, to get it right, made them sorrow, caused them to sorrow to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us and nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, the selfsame thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. That's That sorrow that came into life, it made them better people. Why? Because they became more careful. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. They were, now he's not saying that they went out and became you know, vengeful people. He's saying that they avenged them. They took revenge on all those things that they had allowed themselves to take part in. You know, they were getting it right. They took revenge on, on the sin that had come into their lives. What zeal. I mean, we would want to be zealous people, right? At least we should. Well, it might be that you know the preacher has to get up and rip some things from time to time right. and tell us to get it right. And it might make us feel bad, but it's it's a god it's a godly sorrow that's going to work repentance in our lives. And you know, sorrow, suffering makes us better people. It makes us better Christians because you know what it does? It makes us mindful of others. It makes us more mindful of the suffering of, of others. We don't. We does, it allows us to not become 
desensitized to the, the suffering of, of people around us. Yeah. <clears throat> the Bible says in Hebrews 2, 8, 18, uh, go ahead and turn over to, uh, uh, go over to uh, Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13. You know, suffering makes us mindful of others. And here it talks about Jesus says, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. And I kind of already touched on this earlier about how you know, when we go through things in our life, it might be so that we can offer counsel to somebody else down later that goes through the same thing. That's what it's saying here. He that himself suffered being tempted, he's able to succor, you know, or to help or to, you know, care for them that are tempted. He knows what they've gone through. It's not just an empathy, it's actually a sympathy. They actually he knows exactly what it is that they're going through. Not just saying, oh, I can, you know, I can understand. It's like, no, I can relate. I know what you're going through. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, verse 1, let brotherly love continue. Be forgetful, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and with them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. You know, we should be mindful of other people around us. Mindful of them that are in bonds as bound with them. <clears throat> and them which suffer adversity as yourselves be also in the body. Now, how are we going to do that? How are we going to have that kind of mindset? We're going to have to let suffering come in. It's going to come into our life. And God allows suffering to come in our life so that we can, we can do this, so that we can empathize with others, so that we can succor others, so that we can relate to them. You know, we should mind others that are suffering because, you know, one day it might be us that is suffering the same thing. You know? You know, when we hear about a brother that, you know, is, is, is in bed, bedridden, has got sickness, at least let them know we're thinking about them. You know, at least let them know, hey, we missed you. And say, because it might be us one day that's bedridden. And wouldn't it be a shame if nobody at church ever, we didn't, we didn't hear who from them. You wonder, do they even care? You know, and, and, and really, this is a spiritual family. We should care about one another here. Amen. You know, we talked a lot about suffering tonight, and it's not a very fun topic to talk about. It's not something that we like to talk about, but it's a reality we all have to face. And I and I I purposely saved the title of the sermon for for the for the the last point here. And the title of the sermon is this. It's called Suffering Has an End. You know, suffering is something that we're going to have to go through. It's something that we're going to have to endure in this life. It's something that's bound to come to all of us in some shape or form or another. And it's something that we're going to have to learn to embrace. And it's something that we also have to learn how to cope with and, and make sure that it doesn't become a way of life for us. But we can always have this hope that one day suffering is going to come to an end. And if you would, turn back to Revelation 21. Revelation 21. The Bible says in Psalm 30, For his anger endureth for a moment, and his favor is light. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. The Bible talks about the fact that joy always comes back. That there's a season to weep, there's a season to mourn, there's a season to be happy. There's a season to laugh. You know, suffering has an end. And we see here in Revelation 21 that it comes to a permanent end. Not just a cycle of, of happy and sad, mourning, laughter. But there's actually a point in time when suffering is just done away with completely. We saw that in Revelation 21. Look at verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more seeing. And I, John, saw the holy city, the New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, neither crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. You know, whatever we're going through in life, whatever sorrow, whatever suffering we're enduring, we have this precious, you know, beautiful, wonderful, joyous, indescribable reality to look forward to. This is a reality. There is a literal city that's going to come down from heaven. And, and God himself is going to dwell among men. And God himself is going to wipe away all tears. And death is going to be finished. Pain is going to be finished. Sorrow is going to be finished. Weeping is going to be done away with. All the sources of sorrow and anguish and pain that come into our life are going to be abolished. 
death itself is going to be gone. Mm -hmm. That's a reality that we need to embrace and, and, and keep in front of our minds and understand that you know we have to suffer now. There's going to come a time when suffering has an end. <clears throat> you know, suffering will have no purpose in heaven because it will be made perfect in Christ. There, you know, we will attain. You know, God allows the suffering to come in now to make us better people. And when we get to heaven, there will be no purpose for suffering because we'll be made perfect in Christ. The Bible says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. You know, when God comes and dwells among men, and we will be like He is, there will be no more point to suffering. Because we're, we'll be made perfect in Him completely, body, soul, and spirit. So, it only stands to reason that suffering will have an end. Let's go ahead and pray.